this world reappears and wars to war. All I once thought gain, I have counted lost, spent and worthless now, compared to this, knowing you, Jesus. everyone to come in from the foyer and let's stand as we worship this morning. I will worship, I will worship with all of my heart. With all of my heart. I will praise you with all of my strength, all my strength, I will seek you. I will seek you all of my days. All of my days, I will follow. I will follow, follow all of your ways. All your ways, I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. I will bow down. I will bow down. And hail you as King. Hail you as King. I will serve you. Give you everything. Give you everything. I will lift up. I will lift up my eyes to your throne. My eyes to your throne. I will trust you. I will trust you. I will trust you alone. Trust in you alone. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. 
I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy And nothing can keep us apart So remember your people Remember your children Remember your promise, O oh God Grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation And all your people sing along So remember your people Remember your children Remember your promise, O oh God Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Heaven reaching down to us. Your grace is enough for me. God, I see your grace is enough. I'm covered in your love. Your grace is enough for me. For me. So I was reading um, devotions kind of, sort of, um, earlier. Th Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I?
to know you here on the earth. And I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. For me and my house, we're gonna 
serve you for me and my house. You'll get the praise for me and my house. We're going to love you always. For me and my house, we're going to worship for me and my house. You'll get your way for me and my house. We're going to love you always. I speak to the enemy. You can't have my family. With heaven's authority, we take back our destiny, because we belong to the Lord. I speak to the enemy, you can't have my family, because we belong to the Lord. With heaven's authority, we take back our destiny, because we belong to the Lord. especially our guests. We hope that you have an enjoyable time here. We're glad to have you here. As you can see, our pastors are all gone, so the church council is taking charge of the service today. So uh, have some patience with us, and uh, I think it'll be hopefully enjoyable for everyone. Let's begin with a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, again for this opportunity so we can gather together as a congregation to worship you, honor you, fellowship, serve you, and learn about you. We thank you for all those that have parts here today that uh, we can make this a meaningful service for, for everyone. We pray be with our pastors in the various directions that they're in this at today. We pray that you bless them and, and that they've had a time of rest and, and some relaxation this past while. We know that Myron and Greg are preaching today. Give them discernment and words and wisdom as they speak to the various congregations that they're at. We pray that especially you lay your hand on uh, the church council here as we're taking charge that uh, you give us a calmness and a direction there. We ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. I guess we'll begin with a devotional. So uh, I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Very familiar verses. Nothing new, nothing groundbreaking here. But uh, I would like to read from 4 to 9, verses 4 through 9 in chapter 12, Romans. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being, men, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Now, I guess when I read these verses and was thinking about 
using them for devotional, was felt led to them. I seem to think, my mind seemed to be drawn to our Sunday school classes. Now here in about another month, we're gonna have our annual reorganization. And no doubt there's gonna be some people that are gonna teach and they're gonna be teaching for the first time. And there'll probably be some people that are gonna teach, but it's been a very long time since they've taught. And of course, there'll probably be a few of the perennials that teach consistently every year. But uh, as I was reading these verses, I was thinking of that. And I remembered a story that I heard on the radio about a year ago. And it's not a true story, and it's not even a new story. They made it clear that when I heard it, that it was an, there was an old story even at that time. But it's the story of a town that had some sort of great need or charity where they needed to raise money. And the town was really excited about somehow coming together and raising money for this, this need. So the, the town's Rotary Club, they got the great idea that they were going to challenge the town's Elks Club to a baseball game. So they went and uh, gave them the, the challenge. And the Elks Club, they accepted the challenge, but with the understanding that it would be only for the oldest members of their clubs. It was going to be an old-timers charity baseball game. Well, the Rotary Club, they thought, yeah, that'd be a great idea. They thought that'd be pretty exciting. So the, the Elks Club, they did this because they knew that one of their older members, when he was young, he was a star baseball player. He played, uh, he was a pitcher, and he played all through college, and he even played a few years in the minor leagues. He was, he was that good. So after the challenge was accepted, they went straight to his house, and they asked him if he'd be willing to pitch for them. And he saw their enthusiasm and their excitement, and he wanted to help with his charity, so he said, yep, I'll do it. Well, then after they left, he got thinking about it. And it had been a very, very long time since he played baseball or even handled a baseball, years and years. And it made him a little nervous. So he went out to his garage. He found a couple baseballs. He went to an empty lot behind his house. And he threw a ball and only went a few feet in front of him and hit the dirt. Well, that wasn't very good, so he grabbed it again, he threw it again, and went a little bit farther, but still not very good. It just seemed his arm had no strength and no coordination. So he went in the house, and he told his wife, he said, I, I think I made a mistake. They wanted a pitcher, and I, I was excited, I want to do it, and uh, I want to be part of this, but I'm not very good. And she encouraged him, she said, well, you keep practicing, and it'll come back to you. So he did this. So he found a trusted friend, and every night he practiced. And it got a little better, but he was still pretty bad. He would throw the ball, and he just couldn't seem to get any speed, no distance, and certainly no accuracy. And he'd go to town. Well, the news of this game had really spread through town, and everyone was really excited about it, thought this was going to be a lot of fun, a lot of great. And he'd go to town, and people would tell him, Boy, we're really excited about this. We, we know you can do a good job and, and all those kinds of words of encouragement. He's just too embarrassed to tell him how bad he was. And he kept practicing. And one night after some particularly bad practice, he went in the house and he told his wife, I can't do this. He said, I, I'm just going to embarrass myself, embarrass my team. It's not just not going to work. And she told him, you just keep practicing and you keep working at it. You're not as good as you were but no one is on the team. That's the way it's going to be. And it's not about how good you are. It's about this charity and raising money. So you just keep practicing, and you'll get better, and you do as good as you can. Well, he, he was pretty encouraged by that, so he, so he did that. He kept practicing, and with some results. Then it came time for the big game and the day. And, of course, this, this news of this spread to that town and other towns, and uh, everyone's excited about it. The grandstand was full and people were lined up behind the fence and it was just packed. And even the local media had sent reporters there and there was a number of reporters there. They were gonna cover the game. So everything seemed pretty good, good time. And then it came time for the, for the old pitcher to do his thing. And so he walked out and he gets on the pitcher's mound and he threw his first pitch and it fell way short of the plate, kind of bounced to the catcher. Well, that wasn't very good. He threw another pitch, and that one got more distance, but it went wild to the right. And then he threw another one, and that one went wild to the left. And it went on like this, and his pitching was terrible. 
And a few times he did get it over the plate. It was kind of lobbed so slow and, and arced so high that the batter could easily hit it. And, uh, and people were really starting to, you know, they started chuckling and laughing. Well, then they started uh, making fun of him. And then they started ridiculing him. And it was starting to get pretty ugly in a hurry. And just as it was starting to get really ugly, this old lady, his wife, got out of the grandstand and she started going down there and she walked out towards the field and, and she started to catch people's attention and they all kind of got quiet and watched her. And then right in the middle of play, she walked right out into the field and all the players, they stopped playing. They're trying to figure out what she's doing. She goes up to her, to her husband, the old pitcher, and she whispers in his ear and then he got beat red and then just as quick as she went out there, she turned right around and ran back. Well, the, the old pitcher, he regained his composure and then he threw a pitch and it was a strike. And then he threw another pitch and that was a strike. And within a couple innings, he had regained speed, he'd regained accuracy and he was throwing curve balls and knuckle balls and fast pitches and he was just really on fire. And of course, the Elks Club went on to easily beat the Rotary Club. So after the last play of the game, everybody runs out into the field to, to congratulate these players on such a wonderful game. And the reporters, they ran out and they went right to the pitcher and, and, and you know what they're gonna ask, right? They wanted to know, if it's not too private, and it's not a secret, do you mind telling us what it is your wife whispered in your ear? And he got kind of sheepish. She said, well, it's not private and it's really no secret. She just reminded me that I always used to pitch left-handed so, but, so well, going back to our verses here, I thought that was a little witty, but it kind of made me think of our Sunday school classes. You know, when we look at our verses here, all these gifts, is there one gift more important than the other? The Bible makes clear that there's not. We think of our Sunday school class, well, certainly, certainly the teacher would be more important, wouldn't he? Well, you think of the story, the old pitcher won the game, but who was the hero? It wasn't him, it was his wife. She's the hero of the story. And look at verse, uh, where is it here? Verse eight, it says, and he that exhorteth on exhortation. That's what he used to concentrate on, exhortation. What is exhortation? Well, I think the NIV says encouragement. Maybe a few of the other translations say encouragement, but I like exhortation, because exhortation is, is above and beyond encouragement. It's, it's more than just encouragement. Encouragement would be the people before the game going up to him, tell him he can do a good job, and they're looking forward to it, and uh, they know he can do it. That's encouragement. Encouragement is after the game, running out and congratulating him on a good game. But exhortation is having the courage and the initiative to run out in the middle of the game and, and speaking up and doing what, he need, what needs to be done. That's, that's exhortation. In our Sunday school classes, it would be encouraging to tell your teacher, especially these new ones coming in, that uh, you know, you're excited about him teaching, you know he can do a good job, you're looking forward to it, that's encouraging. After class, you can tell him, yeah, you did a good job. That'd be encouraging. That's important. That's very important. That's appreciated. And that is exhortation, but exhortation is more than that. And there's a, a variety of ways. We could never exhaust the list of ways of exhorting. But I think of four particular ones that would really stand out in Sunday school class. First and foremost, do you attend regularly and consistently? That would mean a lot to a teacher. If a teacher had 20 people on his roster, and only four or five showed up, that wouldn't be very encouraging, would it? That'd be a little discouraging. He'd start to wonder, maybe it's my teaching that's keeping people from being there. So good, consistent attendance is important. Secondly, do you prepare? Do you study the lesson? Do you read it over? Do you pray about it? Do you meditate on it? Do you come to class prepared? That goes a long ways too. I, you know, often you hear people say, well, I, or think, you might think, I'm just not getting much out of the lessons lately. The lessons just aren't really speaking to me. And I think I would challenge you to wonder, are you, are you really studying them as you should on your own before class? Do you come to class prepared? And then along with that, thirdly, are you willing to speak up? Are you willing to talk? I think the one thing you always hear from a teacher on the very first Sunday of Sunday school year, the first thing they say is, I don't mind teaching, 
but I don't want to do all the talking. Of course they don't. That's discouraging when you do all the talking. You want people to participate. And uh, I think good exhortation is coming prepared, willing to speak. If your teacher seems to be missing on some points, speak up. Do it in a loving way that complements his lesson, not hijacks it, but uh, participation. And then fourthly, I can think of you at least occasionally, maybe even once a year, would you be willing to even take his place for a Sunday? Would you be willing to teach for him, give him a break? If you would do that, I think uh, not only would you appreciate his teaching more, but you would appreciate the exhortation of others. You'd see the value in it, and you'd be willing, more willing to, to do that. And, uh, and there's a variety of other ways. I'll leave that up to you guys to think of different ways that you could to do that. But uh, I think if you start with that, and, and I guess that's how I would close with this, is uh, it's five more weeks before the new year starts, but uh, you don't have to wait till then. You can start practicing now. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for all the various gifts that you've given the, the individuals in our congregation. We know some are teachers and some are pastors and some have been called to be leaders in the Sunday school, superintendents. But Lord, we know there's a job for everyone. And for those of us that just sit in class, we're not just to sit there, we're to exhort, we're to give encouragement, give encouragement to each other, give encouragement to our teachers. We know that you have a lot to teach us through through your word, and while your spirit illuminates that and, and guides us in that, there's an importance in helping each other with that, and that's where exhortation comes in. We pray that you would lead us in that, open our eyes to opportunities where we can exhort, where we can exhort our teachers and, and others in the church. We think especially for this ministry that our church has, we know many other congregations have kind of lost that. It's just not either well attended or, or poor participants participation and teaching and things. We pray that that would not be the case here, that we would continue to value it and make the most of it. We know that uh, you can speak through that and we ask you to do just that today and, and every Sunday. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, with that, I guess we'll call on our... When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way while we do his good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy us but to trust and obey but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus 
but to trust and obey. Then in fellowships we, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. For the says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. And then if you'll stand with me and turn to number 316. Number 316. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. <clears throat> Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed. child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer, I think of him all the day long. I nothing for I cannot be silent, his love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the King in whose law I delight, whose lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I... Be hum be I stand here this morning humbly before you, knowing that I have nothing to offer on my own. And I thank you that I'm trusting your word. It tells us that your word is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And so, as we open your word this morning, we ask that you would work in us to bring about the results that you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, I'm going to be sharing from Samuel this morning, so if you want to open to, uh, or, I'm mean, sorry, Joshua. <laughs> if you want to open to Joshua chapter 1, um, it's what I feel God has laid in my heart. Um, I want to look at uh, different people in the beginning of the book of Joshua um, and how they responded to God and then how that relates to us. We'll start in Joshua 1, we'll read verses 1 to 9.
Joshua 1, verses 1 to 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So the Joshua, or God gives Joshua a big task here. God commissions Joshua to bring the children of Israel into the promised land. It was no small task. According to Numbers 2651, there were 601,730 men who were over 20 years old and who were able to go to war. It's estimated if you consider their, their wives and children, the number was probably somewhere around two and a half million or more. So why would God choose Joshua for such a task? Uh, Numbers 2718 gives God's definition of Joshua. It says, So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of man, a man, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. And I think what greater honor could anybody have than that God would say his spirit is living in this man? And because Joshua had the Holy Spirit, he was faithful to God in his life. Um, Joshua wasn't perfect, but he had a long history of being a faithful servant. And one example we have of his faithfulness is recorded in Numbers 14, 6 to 9. If you want to just keep your fingers in Joshua and turn back to Numbers. Numbers 14, 6 to 9. And uh, the account that I'm going to read now is nearly 40 years prior to what we just read. Uh, Moses had sent 12 spies to search the land of Canaan and bring him a report. Ten of the spies came back saying the land and the food were good, but the enemy was just too big and too strong. They decided they should choose a new leader and return to Egypt. But the other two spies, Joshua and Caleb, tell the people that the Lord can give them the victory. So we'll read Numbers 14, 6 to 9. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they, spoke, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And if we were to continue reading there, we would see that the people wanted to stone them for taking this bold stand. Um, like I said, this, this account was nearly 40 years prior to what we read in Joshua 1. In that whole span of time, uh, the 40 years, nearly 40 years, Joshua was serving God under the leadership of Moses. I believe most of you know the story here as we move ahead in the book of Joshua. The Israelites came into the promised land and immediately had to uh, take on their enemies. The city of, uh, sorry, the first city God told them to conquer was the walled city of Jericho. Following God's instruction, they marched around the city one time each day for six days. Then on the seventh day, God has them march around the city seven times. After the seventh time around the city, 
The priests blew their trumpets, all the people shouted, and God brought down the walls to give the city to the Israelites. So we have Joshua, he's proven himself faithful and God has appointed him to take child, the children of Israel into the promised land. Now let's look at Joshua 2 verses 1 to 13. The next person that we'll take a look at is Rahab. Joshua 2 verses 1 to 13. Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly saying, go view the land, especially Jericho, so they went and came to the house of a harlot, Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Excuse me. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan to the fords, and as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted, neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. And spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. So Rahab recognized here how powerful God was and she turned to him for refuge. I gave Rahab here the title of a new believer. I find it interesting that Rahab had what we would call the heart of a new believer or the first love of a new believer. In verses 12 and 13, she wants to save her family also. And um, Rahab is mentioned several other times in scripture. In uh, Hebrews 11, verses 30 and 31, it says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friend, <clears throat> excuse me, because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. In James 2.25, it says, and in the same way was not also Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. And in Matthew 1.5, she's mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. When the spies came to Rahab's house, she chose to put her trust in the God of Israel instead of her government or city walls. And she transitioned from a sinner to a new believer, a follower of the one true God. Um, next, I wanna look at a group of people, and that's the rest of the inhabitants of Jericho. They're also mentioned in the portion that we read in chapter two, um, but I've titled them as non-believers. And I wanna, we'll just go back and read chapter two, verses nine to 11 again, and see here what Rahab said about all the people um, in Jericho. Chapter two, verses nine to 11. She said, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and, that you, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. 
So uh, Rahab says here that when the people had heard the deeds of the Lord, their hearts melted and they lost all their courage. But the rest of the inhabitants of Jericho had a very different response than Rahab did. Rahab recognized how God was, sorry, Rahab recognized who God was and begged the men of God for mercy. In contrast, Joshua, if we went ahead to Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. So the people of Jericho recognized they were in trouble without God, but instead of asking for his help and his mercy, like Rahab had, they relied on themselves and the walls that they had put up. And we know from the account that um, that, that ended up bringing them utter destruction. The last person I chose to look at today is Achan. I titled him an imposter. He was an Israelite. He had seen God miraculously feed and care for him and the rest of the people as they were in the wilderness, but he was not following God. It occurs to me that there could be an imposter here today. Maybe someone who grew up in the church or someone from a Christian family but this person just goes through the motions and does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to uh, look at Joshua chapter 6, verses 17 to 20. Joshua chapter 6, verses 17 to 20. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things. This is talking to Israelites. Abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And then we'll go over to chapter 7, verse 1. It says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Um, God, had, God had given the people of Israel through Joshua um, clear direction that they weren't supposed to take anything for themselves. Um, and we see here a direct violation of what, what uh, Achan was warned not to do. They had been warned that if they kept anything for themselves, it would bring a curse on themselves and Israel. Um, Let's look at chapter 7, verses 11 to 26. And this is God speaking here. Chapter 7, verses 11 to 26. Israel has sinned, And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of their cursed things and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it in among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will will I be with you anymore, unless you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because... Thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to the tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to families. And the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. 
Then it shall be that he who has taken with the accursed things shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the clan of Judah and he took the family of the Zarhites and he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household man by man and Achan the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. Now Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them. <coughs> Excuse me. I coveted them and took them, and there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent, with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. <coughs> then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned him with fire after they had stoned him with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones that still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Acre to this day. So Achan um, totally disregarded the warning, and he does exactly what Joshua had warned him not to do. As a result, he dies, his family dies, and more than 30 other men died. What a sad, stark contrast Achan was to Rahab. She had grown up in a wicked city, and turned to the Lord. He grew up knowing what was right and chose not to follow in it. You know, as I stand here today and I look out, I can say I know you. And to some extent, I do. I see my dad. I know him pretty well. And there's Roger. Uh, he's a farmer I had the privilege of working with sometimes and gave me a lot of good advice when I was youth pastor. And I see Andy, he's my neighbor, and one of my first Sunday school teachers when I started coming to Nomberg. I could keep going, I could name most of you and say how I know you, but I won't, I won't do that, you can relax. I won't do that to you this morning. Um, but the truth is that really only God knows your heart this morning. Maybe you're like Joshua. I called him a faithful servant. That's, how, that's the description I gave him at first, before I found God's description, a man in whom his spirit is. I hope that's true for you this morning. I hope that you're a Christian with the Holy Spirit of God living inside you, guiding and directing your life. But if you're here this morning as an unbeliever or an imposter, I want you to know that you can leave here this morning like Rahab, as a new believer. Regardless of what your past looks like, if you ask Jesus to come in and take over and forgive your past, you can leave here today as a new believer. Any sin, any unbelief, any running away from God, it can all be forgiven and washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, something that caught my attention about Achan, after God revealed uh, who had committed the sin, and Achan finally admitted um, that he had done it, he said, um, and, I, and I condense Joshua 7, 21 here, but he said, when I saw, I coveted, and I took. His admission there of I coveted reminded me of the Ten Commandments. And I was going to close this morning by reading the Ten Commandments. Um, but as I was going over my notes this morning, um, 
I was reminded of some verses in Matthew, uh, Matthew 13, 47 to 50, so I'm going to read those. Um, I was going to read the Ten Commandments, not because keeping the Ten Commandments will save us, but Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I thought it would just be a good way of reflecting on how we're doing. Um, and I would still encourage you to read those this afternoon if you have time. Exodus, you can read them in Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17. Um, that's where I was going to read them from this morning. But this morning we'll read um, Matthew chapter 13, verse, verses 47 to 50. These verses came to me when I was looking at how God dealt with Achan and, um, and how someday unbelievers will be dealt with. Matthew 13, 47. Uh, it starts out talking about a dragnet, and, I, and I, when I read the verses, I thought, it reminded me of, of Nate's sermon last Sunday. He did a really good job, and I liked the analogy he used of the dragnet bringing in different people into the kingdom. But here Jesus uses the dragnet example, still bringing in different people at the end of the time, um, but the good will be separated from the bad. Verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind which when it was full, they drew to shore, and they sat down and gathered the goods into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. This is hard even to read. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. You know, the only difference between the good and the bad here is that at one point the good recognized that they were bad and that their only hope was Jesus and they asked Jesus to come into their life and to take away the sin. If God's speaking to you this morning, please do not leave here without getting right with him. You know, maybe God spoke to you during worship time this morning. Maybe something during Dan's devotions. Maybe as we work, looked at the word together now, whatever it is, whatever he brings to your mind, please deal with it. Just talk to him about it. Be honest with the Lord this morning. He already knows what you're thinking, what you're going through. Um, but he wants you to acknowledge it and ask, ask you for his help. Um, you know, the pastors aren't here this morning, but the church council's here. The, um, several of the church, or the, several of the youth leaders are here. We have Sunday school superintendent, Sunday school teachers. There's people to talk to. Um, reach out to someone if you have questions or if you would like someone to pray with you. If you'd like to come up to the front and, feel, and pray, feel free to do that. I can tell you from my own personal experience that some of the most transforming times in my life have been when I humbled myself and came forward at an altar call, publicly acknowledging that I need to make a change. I'm going to pray. We're a little bit early, and I didn't know how much time I'd have or how much time it would take. I asked Sam to come up and lead a few more songs if we needed more time. Sam, I think if you could lead two more songs after I pray, that would probably be adequate. Um, and like I said, please take time this morning God's speaking to you to deal with that. Tomorrow may be too late. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you to make it very clear to us that we have a choice to make, to do right or to do evil. And if we follow you, if we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, we can spend eternity with you. But if we don't, the consequences are going to be terrible. And Lord, I just ask that you would search our hearts this morning. 
Help us to make sure we are right with you before we leave here today. Father, help us to be able to pray like David did in Psalm 143.10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bow down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. Israel forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. When hoary time shall pass away, and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong. Redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels' song. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky it, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. And then, over quite a few pages, number 482. <clears throat> Number 482, The Solid Rock. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. O oh, Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to veil his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. 
On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant and blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, healing is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clad in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Thank you.